Big Noon Kickoff presents the Bear Bets Podcast. I am your host, Chris the Bear Felica, along with my co-host, Jeff Schwartz, who is a little little, little down this week. Not, not down as much as I thought he would be after the uh, the Oregon loss in Seattle last week, but looking forward to another uh, exciting, enjoyable week of college football. Unfortunately, it hasn't been super profitable with the uh, with the picks on the show so far. I just can't seem to... Be on the be on the right side of a lot of these games, and uh, I, I know you see a lot of the like the, the kind of the public sides are yeah. kind of doing well, and I'm more of a contrarian guy and stay away from those. So hopefully this will even out by the by the end of the season. But we're 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 in striking distance. So we're it's 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 been it's been an L so far, but we're we're going to turn it around. Um, last week, I just don't know. Like I came out of that game really feeling like Oregon. Like we went into the game yeah. thinking Oregon was the better team, and in watching the game, it kind of felt like Oregon yeah. was the better team. And I didn't hate all like Dan Lanning was getting killed. The only one of those decisions that I hated and thought that he should have done differently was I thought he should have just taken the points before halftime because part of the purpose of going for it deep in yeah. the territory is if you don't get it. Then the opponent has the ball at the three yard line, and odds are you're going to get field position yep. back, and it, it's still a, a, a positive win, win probability play. But you should have taken the points before the half, and that's really the only thing that, that I had. And some people maybe nitpick why you leaving it up for a 43 yard field goal, and maybe you should have gotten closer. Well, but, they tried to, but, but like yeah, it, it, but it's not like so. <laughs> I don't know. I I, 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 I am always going to be someone who leans on the side of of aggressiveness for a play caller. Like, I want you to be aggressive. I want you to go for it. I think in hindsight, Dan Lanning said, yeah, we, we, we should have taken those three points. Because they were free points. There was an interception before the end of the half. And you had the ball down. And you, you take the three points. And you get the ball after the half. If you weren't getting the ball after the half, maybe you go for seven. You say, go for it. But, you know, in, in there's a double up opportunity. It's called double up opportunity when you're able to score to end the first half. And then score to open the second half. So that could be a 10 point swing, a 14. I played in games myself where I was down 14 right before halftime. We scored seven, scored seven again. You're right back in the game, right? Like the double up opportunity. And what's funny is Oregon and Washington are both two of the best teams in the nation, that middle eight, right? That again, the four minutes were in the first half, four minutes after. Uh, for first four minutes of the second half, and I think neither scored in that game no. in the middle eight. So, um, you know, and then look, the, the one at the end of the game, go for the win, go for the win. I didn't like the play calls, I, I like the decisions. The play calls I thought were not what Bo Nix does well in those rollouts. So, look, it's a learning experience. We got to beat our rivals, obviously. But my, my favorite thing about this game is someone who is a Pac 12 guy for one more season, unfortunately, is that it felt like the, the narrative around this game was that of an SEC game where both teams got pluses, whether you won or lost. Like if Oregon mm-hmm. would have won, Washington would have got the plus two. For And teams look at both these things and think, oh, yeah, no, they're both really good. And we're not going to ding them for losing this game. I think both teams, again, nationally can be competitive. I think Washington's offense, mainly Michael Penix, might be the best individual unit in the country right now. Like you can argue maybe Michigan's defense, mm-hmm. maybe Georgia's defense, but Washington's offense and what Michael Penix can and they do. They were shorter receiver of the game, too. They were short. McMillan was was out. I, I was surprised he played because his knee injury, I think, is more significant than we let it on to be. Because uh, he heard against Michigan State. They said he was fine. They didn't play for three right. weeks. Yeah. And, and he tried to come back against Oregon. Uh, but what Michael Penix can do with that ball, man, and that's the frustrating part about being someone who roots against him. It's like, you're just like, it's just a go route. Like, knock the ball down. <laughs> like, you know, the throws are so perfect, right? They're so perfect. I think Washington offensively, and I'm not sure Washington beats Georgia or Michigan in a playoff game, but offensively, I think they have the best unit in the country right now. Um, They do that better than anyone else does anything else in the country. And Washington, look, they're really good, and and, and they won that game, and it's unfortunate Oregon couldn't win that game. But uh, it was nice to hear the narrative more around both teams being good rather than the narrative, oh, the Pac-12 conference just eats itself up like uh, like they always do. And they they still may yeah, do that. But that doesn't mean the conference stinks. I Correct. Mean, no, that actually means the conference but, is good because the depth at the top yes, of the league is, is good where these teams are but, they're capable of beating. This weekend, we obviously have a, a, the first of basically three Big Ten games that matter, right? Ohio yep. State, Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, and then Michigan, Penn State. In the Pac-12, there's like 12 of them this season, yep. right? Like, So that tells you the depth. Of, even the SEC, right? You look at how many games in Alabama, Tennessee matters this weekend for the East, uh, for the West, obviously, right? Like, um, 
and Alabama might lose that game. But there's there's not a lot of games in each con- in conferences this season that really really matter. And the Pac-12 this season has a lot of them. Of course, the Pac-12 is being blown to, to smithereens. So, uh, but another another fun week of uh, of of college football. Anything else off the top for you before we get to your your wagers of the week? No, I, I just found myself, and we'll get into it later in the uh, in, in the group chat. Like I real, I found myself looking for a lot of a lot of futures this week. Like I, I yeah. the Heisman stuff. I started. I found a couple of plays that I'll get into, and it, it feels like we kind of know a lot of the conference championship yeah. games. Like kind of like the Pac-12 should be Washington, Oregon. But if it's not, it's it's USC probably. Right. The ACC will be North Carolina and Florida State. Uh, the Big 12 is going to be OU, and, Texas. Wait, they don't play each other in the regular season, correct? North Carolina, Florida yeah. State. No, North Carolina has Clemson. Yeah, Clemson. And, yeah. and that's it. Uh, that like, be the, a great game. like the SEC, the SEC we we, we know is is, is going to be Georgia versus Alabama or LSU if LSU can pull an upset. Like the Big Ten is the only one we really aren't sure because it could be any of the three from the East. And I guess Iowa will be <laughs> from the West, but does it really matter? 11 and one. They're going to have to fire their offensive coordinator because they can't score yeah. enough points to keep them. Um, yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's fun to watch this kind of, you know, as we, and, and I think even a couple of weeks ago, we, we discussed about like how open everything was. The Heisman race was open. Yep. Conference races were open. Now, as we get closer, it just kind of narrows and narrows and narrows down. It's funny. The big 10 this year gets hurt by not ha- by having divisions still because everyone yes. else does not Right. I think right. everyone else does not And so now, you know, you would love to see a rematch between one of those three schools to be two of the three schools. Right. And now you're going to get uh, someone against next year against, uh, against Iowa. Iowa. Oh, yikes. You didn't, you didn't like the Iowa, Michigan, big 10 championship game a couple years ago. I was there 42 to three. It was, it was a ton of our 45, three, something like that. Um, the total this weekend in Iowa and Minnesota, I believe it's Iowa, Minnesota is 31 30, and a half. And it was 30 and it was 32 last year. And it was 13, 10. Is that a game that you will – will you tease that in any direction? Will you play that game? Like I, won't, I won't go anywhere near that game. Just, like, like, just not even like, – I'm looking vomit, up right, right now. Vomit like inducing. Not, not even as a joke. You'll be like, ah, I'll put some, put some money on the under here. There's nothing that – like, I usually it's don't like – 31 and a half. <laughs> I have no desire to watch that game. Like, why would you – you have to watch every game you bet on? I – don't have to. I typically do. I, I try to watch some of it just to get an eye before I make a play. I like to have an idea as to, I mean, you can't, you can follow sometimes like following along on a stat play by play. Yeah. But I would like to have an idea, at least like watching, seeing, is yeah. there a weather issue? Is, is, but no. I, I will have, I will not watch a second of that game. Like why, why would you subject yourself to that torture? Oh, you shouldn't. The best part about that game, they play for some sort of trophy. Every Big Ten rivalry has some sort of trophy they play for, and I love it so much. I hope that when Oregon and Washington, UCLA, we go, we start having trophy games more often. Just create, just create some random rivalries. The the the, the duck and dog. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, kind of like a turducken. Kinda. Turducken, yeah. Just get it together. All right, Bear. Let's get into the wagers for the show. We're gonna do, we'll go over your wagers. We'll do some gambling group chat. Then we'll get to our best bets at the end of the show. Let's start with a matchup in the ACC. Pittsburgh at Wake Forest. It's right now it's a pick on the total is 45 and a half. Wake Forest is three and three, but they're 0 and three in conference or two and four against the spread. The Deeks just got blown out by Virginia Tech on Saturday. Pitt is two and four overall and two and four against the spread. They just upset Louisville at home, which I believe like we all kind of called yeah. called that uh loss for uh for Louisville. Where are you going here, buddy? Well, it, it be because of it's Pitt is going to play to the script. You yeah. beat undefeated Louisville. Now you go on the road against a team that scored 16, 12, and 13 the last three weeks and may have a third string quarterback. Yeah. You know what's going to happen here. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Forrest will, will win the game <laughs> because there's nothing to indicate that this, that this yeah. is a team that you'd want to bet on. But it, it still was 17, 12 against Clemson. So, I mean, in Clemson, certainly better than Pitt. Yeah. And that, but, Turned the ball over what eight times, I think, against Virginia Tech and Georgia Tech. Like, go ahead and make your uh, very CC coastal joke yeah. right there. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't care about the quarterback issues. Like, the fact we, we, we talked about on the NFL side, like, Joe, even better that PJ yeah. Walker is playing quarterback yes. for the Browns. Exactly. Even even better that uh, Guido Santucci or whatever his name is for, uh, <laughs> for for Wake Forest might be the quarterback. Give me give me the give me the Demon Deacons. There there is something about as a player when you're playing a backup quarterback, especially when you think to yourself all week, like, 
this is going to be easier. Mm -hmm. Like it's natural to feel that way. Even the NFL, it's natural to feel that way. Both teams, by the way, very alike. They're near the bottom of the sport in points per drive on offense, yes, so are. I'm not sure it's going to matter very much the way it cuts back and forth. And they're, and, and they're good on defense. They're, they're passable on defense. So this, this is one of those games that you're saying, are you going to watch any of it? Well, now you kind of have to. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see, if the, uh, see if the flight has any. It's a 3.30 kick, so I may, I'll be up be flying. You'll be, you'll be flight streaming flight. on the airplane flying back from Columbus. Uh Let's get to this next game. I, th I think you'll actually watch this one here. Uh, your second wager here, uh, Old Miss. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll watch part of this. At Auburn, Auburn getting six and a half points here. Total is 55. Auburn's three and three. Uh, unfortunately, no conference wins. They just lost to LSU by 30 last weekend. Uh, they had three and three against the spread, same as the record. Uh, Old Miss is five and one. Feels kind of quiet. They're five and one. They're off a bye. The Rebels are four and two against the spread here. Um, where are you going with this one? Yeah, because it's kind of a non convincing five and one. Like the Tulane game was a lot closer than the score indicated. Yeah. Uh, the LSU game was obviously coin flippy, last team with the ball. Potentially one even else you had a chance on that final drive to, and the Arkansas game was a one score game. I, I took Auburn plus the six and a half. I know they gave up 48, yeah. and what, it's almost 600 yards to, to LSU last week. And now you got to deal with Jackson Dart and Lane Kiffin. But we, we did see it again. It's Jordan Hare sometimes. It, it, it's a, one of the better home field edges, yeah. I think, in the country. Georgia did need to rally in the second yep. half. And, and if there's one thing that Auburn hasn't done in SEC play, it's turn the ball over. If they can hold on to the ball and like at least not give Ole Miss a short field, that helps their chances. I, I, I took six and a half and expecting a uh, a weird game here between uh, Auburn and Ole Miss. Uh, the, the games at Jordan Hare do seem to be a little bit weird. The thing with Auburn that I think is tough is that they just can't move the ball on offense and they have no explosive plays. And if they other, fall, other than that, if they, if they <laughs> that was the play. Um, I, that just concerns me, right? Like, if they get behind this game, are they coming back? They have to start fast, right? Is, is this, like, to, to, I think, to cover this? You think so. You, you kind of have to. But Old Miss, as you mentioned, off a of bye. They're five and one. It's, I, I looked it up. I was kind of surprised, honestly. I thought they were four and two, like three and three. That's kind of what I thought. Which they very easily yeah, could be. Could easily. Um, all right, back to the SEC for your final wager before we get into our, our best bets later in the show here. South Carolina plus seven at Missouri. Total is 60 here. South Carolina is two and four. They just lost to Florida Lake King Class. Their coach on the IR, right? I mean, broke his foot. Yeah, all got angry. a little angry. Getting all angry. They're three and three against the spread. Missouri is six and one. They covered four of their seven games. They're off a big win at Kentucky last weekend. Uh, Tigers are led by an offense that is 22nd in points per drive. Where are you leaning here? I'm going to take the points here with, yeah. with South Carolina. I know they have struggled against Missouri the last few years. A loss is a favorite. Uh, outright the last couple of years. And Shane, of course, kicked kicked something and broke his foot. <laughs> and I would probably, too, if I blew a double-digit yeah. fourth-quarter lead uh, to Florida and your pass rush totally fell apart. But at least their offense is going now. Rattler is having uh, – it was, was very productive last yeah. week. Uh, they can put up points. They can move the ball. And it's kind of a weird spot for Missouri now, too. You, 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 you beat Kentucky on the road. You maybe have the biggest game in, in Como in quite some time with – Georgia coming in next, and here is South Carolina coming off of a uh, blowing a big lead. You're now a touchdown favorite, and you're supposed to win, and and, and you've got Cook and Bur Burden. It's kind of a kind of a sandwich type spot. I I think the South Carolina offense will do enough to to keep them within that number. I think the important thing you said here is the, is a sandwich spot, right, where you have. Uh, a buy, and then you play Georgia, and and you're feeling really good. You're six and one, and you think to yourself, man, if we could just, you know, if we would have just played a little bit better against LSU, yep. we'd win that game, we're seven and zero going to Georgia. And Georgia, you know, feels a little more vulnerable without Brock Bowers. Uh, do you think like Georgia, like teams will ap approach them a little bit differently, yeah. just mentally w without Bowers so. there? I think so. I mean, because I mean, it's not only what he can do with the ball; it's kind of just teams having to account for him on the defensive side. But at the same time, I will say Kirby actually, Kirby Smart, Georgia coach, said something this week that I read about out the early in the season. Like people were told, why isn't Brock Bowers yeah. getting the ball? What he said like part of the because like that was like by design yeah, to get these other guys involved and know what we had. Because we always knew, we knew we were going to have Bowers, yeah. but so, so now you have some of the other receivers and some of the other players uh who at least are a bit more of a proven commodity. So 
could be a tricky game in two weeks, two weeks for Georgia. Because remember, a couple of years ago, they went there and needed yeah. a second half comeback. The to- game is at Georgia this year, though. That was last year. The Georgia Missouri game at Missouri was last year. You're right. Yeah. I don't know what I don't know what Georgia I'll, need a late comeback. Maybe maybe maybe, yeah. I, maybe I was looking at uh you're, you're maybe, still, I was, maybe you're, I was looking at last year's schedule. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for correcting me. I know people out there now are, are listening. Yeah, Bears know what the hell he's talking but about. That, that that's the problem, right? Like you talk for three hours, yeah. you make one mistake. Yeah, yep. and people <laughs> like I think uh, people just just jump on your fat. Well, here's here's Bears three wagers. He looks up his schedule right now. Yep. You have yep. Wake Forest, a pick him at home, hosting Pittsburgh. You have Auburn at home getting six and a half points against Old Miss. And you have South Carolina plus seven on the road at Missouri. We'll have our best bets later. But right now, time to get to the gambling group chat. It's going to be Sammy P, Will Hill, Chris, and myself. We talk everything college football, cover all the big games of the week, throw down some Heisman odds and all that fun stuff. Here that is right now. Great Bets podcast presented by Big Noon Kickoff. Back with the gambling group chat. Myself, Sammy P, Will Hill, Jeff Schwartz, kick around some of the, the bigger games and some of the other interesting topics of the week. And obviously, one game stands above everything else this week. Penn State going to Ohio State. James Franklin looking for a first win over a top 10 opponent as a, uh, as a ranked team. Penn State been ranked in a top 10 matchup six times, 0-6. So, but this is, however, if you go back and look, a lot of respect for the Nittany Lions here. Down to four, four and a half in a lot of places. It's actually the first time in since 2018 that uh, Ohio State is less than a touchdown favorite at home. So a lot of respect for the Nittany Lions. We'll see what happens. Will, I, I know you, we, we, we've been talking throughout a week, and Sammy, both of you have been talking, but I know, Will, you made it. You did make a play on the under here. Yeah, I think we were all texting Tuesday and we're like, this 47 and a half is too high. 47 will probably go through that key number. But look, we're, we're doing the show and we do the show. I think we're down to 45 and a half, 46. That move doesn't surprise me. Ohio State's really banged up on offense, injuries at running back, uh, you know, a, a bunch of key injuries. I think both these teams want to run the ball. Both these teams have good defenses. I don't know that we trust either quarterback. I don't know if these coaches trust either quarterback. So to me, this is a 23 20 type of game. I, I would take the four and a half. Uh, and, and I still like the under. I mean, it, you're getting to a point where uh, you, you don't want to go too far here uh, away from the opening number in terms of like when you could have bet at 47, now you bet it like say at 44 on, on Saturday or something like that. But to me, this is an under game. It's a close game. Uh, and I like Penn State here. I, I, I think they get it done. Well, I guess I'll go next. I thought Sam was going was to pipe it with, with his, uh, with his uh, hot undertake here. Uh, here here's, here's my issue with Penn State in this game, guys, is you have an offense that is one of the worst in the country explosive play rate and you just can't go on the road against Ohio State and really against any ranked team and have a, a freshman quarterback making his first big road conference start and pickleball your way down the field against a good defense right I mean you, you you just can't expect Penn State to score a lot of points when they're getting four yards of play three yards of play five yards like it's just it's hard to, to have 15 play drives on the road with a first-time quarterback playing in this environment against a good defense. And so I think the under is certainly a player. I played it at 47 like Will did right away. There's no other option here uh, because I think both teams aren't going to score very much. You mentioned the injuries with, with Ohio State. And their offensive line, by the way, is not what has been in previous seasons, which worries me in a game like this. And so I think it's very low scoring, kind of a classic Big Ten matchup right here. But my concern is just Penn State's offense having to you know, sustain drives for four quarters it's hard to do that in college football. You need to have explosive play capability in your offense, and that's not what Penn State does well. So, Sammy, do you have a play on the side? I think we're all kind of uh, in sync here on, on on the total. And I know James Franklin got a little bristled last week about the the, the 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 offense and kind of people calling it out and lack of a big play. But they have scored over 30 points, I think, in like 14 straight games. And uh, it was UMass, and that's when they finally exploded offensively against, against the Minutemen. But I kind of lean Ohio State here. I, I think the... The, the, the cheaper number, the reduced number uh, in a spot where it seems like Penn State is attracting a lot of underdog support. Uh, even if uh, Abuka can't play or if he's limited, uh, we'll, we'll see if Trevor Henderson can go. Jeff alluded to the injuries as well. I, I think the Ohio State defense, is, and Jeff has talked about this as well as a former player, like how many times a, a, a young quarterback has to go on the road in a hostile environment and how tough it is. Now, Drew Aller has played on the road before. Granted, it was, uh, I think, Illinois and, and, and uh, Northwestern. Northwestern, two vaunted uh, home field advantages. 
But 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 I do think that Ohio State defense is going to be out with something to prove today. I, I would I would lay the four and a half with Ohio State. I don't know if you have any thoughts on the side, Sammy. Yeah, laid a little four actually, and it's funny, you know, all this talk four. about Penn State Ooh, nice. tickets on Penn State. Well, it was four when it opened. There was a three and a half on Sunday, and now we're seeing it climb. It's four and a half. There's a five in Vegas. There's a five offshore, and and most bookmakers are telling me that there are more bets on Penn State, but the bigger notable bets are on Ohio State. And look, guys, I can't I can't look at this Penn State schedule. West Virginia, Delaware, Illinois, Iowa, Northwestern, UMass. Woo! Yeah. I mean, they haven't beat anybody good. They haven't played anybody good. Now, that's not entirely their fault. Um, I just think this is a good buy low. Like, I wouldn't lay six. I wouldn't lay seven. But because Ohio State has looked a little bit shoddy, this number has kind of opened a little bit lower than maybe it should. And, um, you know, Kenny White has Ohio State as the highest power rated team in the country. Now, that's one odds maker. That surprises me. I, yeah, I know. I respect him Kenny, but, but yeah. that surprises me. He's got them higher than Georgia right now. Now, again, that's just one odds maker. But, you know, this is what feels like a buy low on Ohio State. And as Will has said, you know, we were talking on Tuesday and Will's like the total's 47 and a half. And we're like, yeah, that's not going to last. It's going to come through. Um, that being said, if it gets to 44, there's going to be the over money coming in. So if you have a 45 and a half, so don't hate that under. But I would lay four and a half with Ohio State still. Interesting game in the uh, in, in the Pac-12. Uh, Utah going to SC. SC just looked awful in every sense of the word uh, last week. Quite frankly, they looked awful against Arizona the week before and probably should have lost uh, to the Wildcats. Uh, SC a seven-point favorite here. Well, I keep going back. If every time I want to hit that enter button, accept wager button on SC laying the seven, I keep thinking. This is Utah's defense. This is a Utah front that they manhandled them last year in the Pac-12 championship game. Do I trust SE's defense at all? Uh, Jeff, you have any thoughts here? Yeah, Pac-12 I, expert. I hit the under almost immediately when this came out because, look, look, Utah obviously put up 34 points last weekend, but they had their leading tackler on defense as their Wildcat running back. And while that works in one week, I mean – eventually Wildcat stops working because there's not a lot of things to do off of that, even with a USC defense that might not be as physical. What's funny about the USC defense, guys, is they're not really good, but their numbers show they're the best defense Lincoln Riley has had as a head coach, which is shocking, right, because they're not any good. Uh, but they're they're passable, right? And when Utah cannot score the football, Utah's 113th in the country, guys, in points per drive on offense. They can't score. So I don't expect them to go in the Coliseum on the road and score a bunch of points. On the, on the flip side, USC's offensive line is a disaster right now. And guess who has the best defensive line in the Pac-12 Conference? Utah does. Like, it's going to be a low-scoring game. It's going to be a grinded-out game where Utah's trying to run the football, not make mistakes on offense. And USC, they, they didn't get back to run the football. They should. But their offense line is going to struggle a lot in this game. And so I just have this game being low-scoring. I have no play on USC or Utah on the, on the side here. But the total for me is an under, and I'm fine with it. Will, I think you like the Trojans, didn't you? I do. It's an interesting contrast because Utah's just so much bigger, stronger, tougher. But like Jeff said, they just can't score. And against UC, uh, against USC, you're going to have to score. You figure you get a, a little bit more of a, a better effort, a focused effort here from USC. This might. So I, I lean USC again. You're late to the party here, but I, I do like USC here. I think this is a good live betting opportunity because if USC gets a lead, Utah on the road, that's not their game to play catch up. So maybe if if USC gets a lead, you hit USC in terms of live betting. But if Utah can can hang with them early, um, then then they can play their style again. I just I don't know that USC uh, Utah has the offense, especially away from home. It's such a different team away from home. They haven't been tested. They haven't played really any good quarterback backs. It's been a bunch of you know backups here. So to me, it's USC, but it's a good live betting opportunity. It's one to keep an eye on. Yeah, I wish Cam Rising was playing. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. Who? I wish he's played all year. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. I mean, it's that's one of the most fascinating situations in college football because remember, Kyle Whittingham was basically alluding to Rising being ready for Florida. <laughs> that was week number one or week zero, whatever we're calling it now. That was a long time ago. And here we are, and it's still like, hey, is Cam ever going to play this year? And I think it's clear to those in the know that it's probably a no. Um, as for the line in this one, it looks so easy, guys, to take Utah. And my concern, not to echo the room, is that USC goes up 10 nothing, 14 nothing, and then Utah's got, you know, the backup quarterback in there trying to make magic down the field and 
Utah tries to turn it into a shootout, and that's the worst case scenario. We're talking pick six, scoop six, whatever. This is a big stay away for me, but I'm definitely not going to take the seven with Utah. It's interesting. Elsewhere in the in the Pac-12, you got Wazoo uh, going to Austin this week, and obviously Oregon, Washington played that great game uh, last week up in Seattle. Kind of a couple weeks ago, we talked about, or at least I I brought up how. If Oklahoma and Texas were to play again in the Big 12 championship game, I would probably like Texas even more coming out of the first meeting where Oklahoma beat Texas. I kind of felt the same way coming out of that game last week where if Oregon and, and UW play in the Pac-12 title game, like I like Oregon in that game just with the the loss, the, the points that Oregon left on the field. Uh, you get a couple of injuries on the same play. Uh, I, I don't know, Jeff, I, I know you're probably going to say yes to this, but wouldn't you like Oregon if UW and the Ducks played again in the Pac-12 title game? If we could convert a fourth down, yeah, I'd love it. <laughs> I mean, like that's, I mean it, it's interesting. Oregon, uh, I think it's like 28 of 45 now on third down, on fourth downs under Dan Lanning in, in, in 19 games, but they're 0 for 9, their last nine attempts against Washington, Oregon State, and Washington. That shows you how, like, it shows you how absolutely so, random coin yes. flippy that is. And, and, if, and if they convert on one of those, they win. And they win that game. And, and I thought Oregon did exactly as the, I thought they would do in that game, which we talked about previously. It just didn't happen. So, but I, I kind of have to see us like, do it before I. There we go. We dropped it us. I love it. And um, you're allowed. You're allowed to drop an us. We, though. We you, have, you played. We, yes, you're good. We have Utah yes. in two weeks. Yes, you do. And if we beat Utah on the road, which again they might not have Cam Rising, I don't expect so. I'd feel better about playing Washington again. I'd love to hear your guys' opinion. I mean, Sammy, the the Oregon hater over here, has been doubting the the the, the Ducks all season. <laughs> I am not an Oregon hater. I went to the Rose Bowl that they beat Wisconsin, and I was very happy to be there. I was very, very happy to be there. Um, I was, look, I, look, the field goal before the half was bad. Like, you probably should have taken the field goal. I know hindsight is twenty twenty, but I actually thought, aside from that, Dan Lanning made all the right decisions. And there were some people that were trying to grill him late. Like, how do you go for it on fourth and two, fourth and three? Because if you get a first down, you win the football game. So I, I have nothing wrong with the way that he coached on the stretch. I thought he did everything right. It's just Bo Nix couldn't make a play. And I, you know, say what you want about the play call, rolling the quarterback out, you know, backing up, throwing off his back foot. I don't think that was the greatest thing, but the decision to go for it there end of the fourth quarter was not a bad idea at all. The play call wasn't great. Um, that's a long way of me saying like, yeah, if this is a repeat in the Pac-12 uh, title game, you're going to see Oregon minus three, probably. That's that's going to be the number. They're going to be favored. They power rate higher. Um, I think they have a better defense. Penix just made the bigger throws. But if this game is played last week 100 times, it's probably 50-50 or 55-45. Yeah, I, I, I felt would, bad for agree. Jeff. That was a tough one. I mean, look, they were they were the better team. They've got better <laughs> players, man for man. That that was a tough one. I mean, Penix was just the difference. Penix, like man for man, Oregon's got the better roster, the better players. It's just you know, Washington was home. Washington had Penix. Oregon did it, and that's a tough one though. That that that's one that's hard to get back. So if if Sammy is going to cash that, or I should say maybe if Sammy's going to cash the uh, the CLV Heisman bet there of all time there with uh, with Penix, who he has from the preseason. Uh, and, and Penix doesn't win the Heisman. I think we all obviously know Penix is the, the front runner for the Heisman. However, you know how last week I said that I really didn't have a grasp on this award uh, when, we, when we recorded the show on Thursday? Well, I'm sitting there Sunday morning in the rain, in, uh, Sunday, Saturday morning uh, in, the, in the rain in South Bend, just kind of thumbing through some, some bets and, and some markets because I can't bet, as we will and I have alluded to many times in Connecticut, the Heisman is unavailable. So I'm going through and I'm looking like who, if, if Oregon does win today, like who do I want to have bets on? And I played two guys. I got JJ McCarthy at 22 to one. And I played Jaden Daniels at 35 to one. This was last Saturday when I was sitting there on the set, I, those numbers, I don't think are still there, but I think some, some decent numbers are still there because the, the thinking is with either of those two guys, if Washington were to lose a regular season game, which they may not, but if Oregon beats him or whoever beats him in the Pac-12 championship game, there's a chance that he may fall behind. And then you got J.J. McCarthy, who potentially is going to be the quarterback of the number one team in the country on a 13-0 Michigan Big Ten champion team going to the playoff for the third straight year. Or maybe LSU beats Alabama in Tuscaloosa. And Daniels, who, by the way, whose numbers are 
probably better than, than what Penix has right now. Just the team has two losses. But if LSU were to win out and get to the SEC championship game, who knows with, with the opportunity that he has there. So I played McCarthy and Daniels to win the Heisman as well. I don't know if anybody out there has any uh, opinion on that or if there was someone else out there that we, uh, that we may have missed. By the way, that's two weeks in a row. We did, we've done a really good job. We, we put the absolute whammy on Miami for making the playoff. <laughs> and then last week we were talking about Brock Bowers. We took him out of the, uh, the highs and race as well. So, uh, Will, I'm going to blame this on you. Well, I think you glossed over a key part of that story. Last Saturday, you're sitting there waiting for a flight connection. These guys can attest. You were in a nasty mood. You were very feisty last oh, Saturday. Angry. I was. Oh, my, my goodness. That was, that was, uh, that was uncomfortable. I, but uh, I don't know. I, I Look, I think if, Penix, <laughs> if, if Washington wins out, obviously it's going to be Penix. Can he absorb one loss? That's a question. I don't know that he can absorb two. Uh, just a couple names I would throw out there, and I think your McCarthy bet's obviously a good one. I, I like that one. Dylan Gabriel may is Carolina schedule doable enough where if they can go undefeated can may get back in the mix at 18, 20 to one. So I don't know if there's a great bet out there. I don't know that Penix deserves to be minus money here. It's a fascinating market, but I don't know. Those are just a couple of names that come to mind for me. I believe at bear bets pod tweeted a clip of me saying to bet JJ McCarthy bear, but nice try there at 25 to one <laughs> nice try. Um, <laughs> I agree. I agree with, well, it's Gabriel. I mean, there's a chance Oklahoma runs the table in the big 12 and I'm right. uh, looking at the Westgate odds right now, seven to one. He took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, there's a guy who's making all the big decisions in Oklahoma to go from all those losses last year to potentially undefeated this year. Not that the Big 12 is the greatest conference in the world, but he's putting up big numbers. That offense is super explosive. And, you know, look, he can get multiple games down the stretch with like four touchdowns. And let's also not ignore the fact that Oklahoma is going to be like, what, 70 degrees the rest of the way, whereas you're at Ohio State, you're at Michigan, you're at Penn State. You're playing in, you know, 35, 40 degree weather, cold rain, maybe snow. So the passing element is never going to really die in these big 12 games down south as we get into November. He, oh, go ahead. I'm I was say, the, the one thing that about Michael Penix that I think is going to hold him back is not that he's not a good quarterback. Is he doesn't run the football at all. That's not a, a knock on him. But when's the last quarterback to win this award that did no running whatsoever? That was a straight pocket passer. I, I get it. Penix is great. I'm, this is not, I'm not denying his greatness. I'm just saying when you look at the history of this award, Heisman voters have tended to look at the quarterbacks like Jaden Daniels, who have over 500 yards rushing so far, and by the way, have 2,700 yards passing over the quarterback that really, I, I looked at right now, Michael Penix has four yards rushing. Now, we know that sacks are a part of that, but he, he's been sacked twice this year. So he's not running the foot. Again, it's not a fault of his. I'm just saying that when Heisman voters are looking at this, are they going to weigh his play differently than, than someone else who's able to use their legs to help the offense? Well, that's the thing. The awards voters are look for stat compilers in a lot. They, they see, they see numbers. They, they don't see things on the defensive side of the ball or other positions that maybe don't accumulate stats. It was funny. You talked about the, the big 12, Sammy, and it's really interesting how this conference is just not good. Like, in expansion this year, bring what the I think next year when OU and Texas go to the SEC, the numbers kind of will even out some. But if you look at the four newcomers so far to the Big 12, they're two and ten combined. And the two wins you had uh, one win, but I think by Cincinnati beat BYU. I think it was BYU over Cincinnati. Two of the newbies, and then the other one was that Houston win over West Virginia, where the Mountaineers just absolutely collapsed and allowed that the touchdown on the final play of the game. So you got four games this week where you got a newbie against an old guard team. You got Baylor at Cincinnati, Texas Tech at BYU, Texas at Houston, and UCF at Oklahoma. Do any of those newcomers have a chance to win this week? I, I know Cincinnati is favored at home against Baylor. Is that the one? Are these other three, other, other three newbies going to get blown out or what? Hold on. Let me go back Sammy, quickly. I don't, I don't mean to I don't want to change gears here, but let's look at Oklahoma's next three games for Gabriel purposes. They're at home against UCF where they could score 70. Then they go to Kansas. Kansas doesn't play defense. Then they go to Oklahoma State, which is a dumpster fire right now for all intents and purposes. Can he throw 12 touchdowns in the next three games? If he can, you can bet a little 7-1 and one right now on sure Gabriel, 8-1 if not higher. And then it's, it doesn't get much tougher. You're at home against West Virginia, at BYU, and at home against TCU. And TCU is not national semifinal, national title good like they were last year. This is a cakewalk no. for Oklahoma the rest of the way, and there's not much defensive resistance. 
No, it ultimately comes down to the Big 12 championship game where they probably will face uh, will, will face Texas again, don't you think, Jeff? Yeah, I think, I think it comes down to that. Uh, the, the thing about the, the Big 12 newcomers is, is we talk about this with, with conference expansion, right, and, 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 and realignment. Only two teams, TCU and Utah, that have come from a group of five up to a power five, or even some schools in like a lower group of five, a lower power five have gone to a better conference. They don't win, Bear. They do not win. It takes a long time for those teams to win. It's a tougher schedule. It's tougher opponents. It's better players you're playing. It's bigger players you're playing against. And you're doing it not just one time. You know, Cincinnati's not playing Alabama once, right? They're playing that the, the same type of team now over nine or 10 games in a row, right? Often without a bye week or maybe one bye week in the middle. And so it, it's no surprise to me to see them struggling. Again, it took Utah, what, eight years to be competitive in the Pac-12? It, it took TCU how many years to be competitive in the Big 12? There's no surprise that these teams are taking a while to get to get up to speed. And I don't think anyone should blame them for that. It's just a part of conference realignment that people do not take into um, consideration when teams are making these jumps. Sammy, I know you were probably ripped apart on Friday night watching Colorado blow that 29 nothing lead. <laughs> and you probably couldn't get to sleep um, after some of the decisions that were made uh, in, in that game and la lack of playing complimentary football and then the overtime. But bad jokes aside, Colorado's not going to win another game, are they? Well, yeah, I think you could light your Travis Hunter, Shadur Sanders, Heisman Trophy tickets on fire, too. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Remember, after week one, there were going to be two Colorado players that were going to win the Heisman, first time yeah. ever. They were going to um, split the vote. Who, who are you going to vote for exactly? They could beat Arizona, but I, I mean, I, I wouldn't put my money on Colorado probably the rest of the way. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they lost out. Um, that game is going to be, you know, Colorado one and a half, maybe two, definitely not the full three. Cause you'll get wise guys take the three with Arizona, but, um, it's slim pickings for them. There are no more easy ones. And you let the game like Stanford basically fall out of the sky. Stanford's up or down what 29, nothing. And they win that game that that can't happen. Um, but I did love the SNL skit with, uh, Keenan Thompson doing a great job. Not about me. <laughs> not about me. Will, it's, is it about you, Will? It's funny because I, I remember I, I picked Stanford last week and uh, I was so close to going to bed and, and I'm still paying for that decision to stay up and watch it. I don't think I've recovered because I had to get up <laughs> early the next morning and that was that ended late. I still can't believe that. That was fascinating to watch because the the announcers are so afraid to say anything against Dion because they don't want to get on his bad side. Like Dion taking the ball in <sighs> overtime. Like I, I just didn't twice understand now. it. Same twice now he's done it. it. Twice. It's crazy. And Sanders is a good player, but that was a ridiculous interception. You have the field goal in your pocket. You're inside the five and he's, you know, backpedaling 15 yards, throwing off his back foot. That was a, just a wild game. Look, I, I, those people that bet over three and a half on Colorado, they cashed, they won their four, but they're probably going to win it by the hook. I, I don't see another win here for Colorado. It's interesting when you look at, at their season, right? The, the TCU win, I think skewed the perception of what this team is. Cause since that time they played like a team that has 85% right. transfers and isn't very good outside of a couple key players, right? I mean, they throw a TCU game out. They they beat Nebraska because Sims just couldn't hold on to the football. He literally would just put the football on the ground, right? They beat a, a bad Colorado State team in double overtime in a game that I think we argued that they easily could have lost. Blown out by Oregon. They lost to USC. I know they made that big second half comeback, but they're down 35-7. They beat a one-win Arizona, uh, Arizona State team by one by one field goal, right? And they lose to Stanford. Like, this is what teams do that aren't very good, but that TCU game and that, and that upset, all the excitement around that, I think, really skewed what this team actually is. And the team is rebuilding. It's, it's a brand new roster. It's a brand new coaching staff playing a tough conference. And, and you look at their schedule, as you mentioned, I mean, the other game is maybe at Washington state, but you're taking a Colorado team on the road to the Palouse in week 11. I played in on the road in the Palouse in week 11. G good luck. It's hard to play there. It's going to be 14 degrees outside, maybe snowing. It's miserable. They're like, I don't think, I don't think they're going to win that game. And so, yeah, you're, you're not going to get to a bowl game here, but that doesn't change the success of the season. I think it's still a good season for Colorado, but right. that TCU game really skewed how we view the rest of their schedule. I, I think that you said successful season, but it, I think it certainly does ch change the tone and the tenor of this. Like, like you're, you're thinking early on with, with that start, oh, wow, they, yeah, they got a real chance to go to a bowl game, and now you're going to be sitting there. If you, before, before the year, if you take, take four and eight before the year, you would have said, great. yeah, absolutely yeah. great, but four and eight after the season with what they were at the start, I think then it turns into a little of, uh, well, that's why that upset in week one changed 
how we felt about them so drastically, even though we probably shouldn't have overreacted in that direction, but it was such right, a good correct. performance. And remember, TCU had two red zone turnovers, You right? You oh, convert and, and, one of those and they win the game and we don't have this discussion. And, and you still had the narrative, of, oh, TCU who yeah. played for the national title. This was not the same right. TCU correct. team like, that played for the national oh, title, who, oh, by the way, was closer to like an yeah. eight and four team last year than they were. When they were 12 and 0. So I, I think it, this makes sense. I mean, four and eight, you're like, yeah, you, they're over the win total. I have under three and a half. Obviously, I lost that wager. Um, but this is about what their team is. I feel like an eight, a four win team, maybe a five win team. If you're lucky, you have an upset and you, you get more talented. You head in next year. Sammy, who's hurt? Who's not playing one, this week? What have you fired on? They, well, they, they beat a one win team by a field goal and then they had 17 penalties against a two win team. So that's the reality. Like they barely beat us. Four, four, twelve men, seven. four, twelve men on the field, right? Sammy, I think it was four times they had twelve men on the field. Seventeen penalties at home. How does that happen? Which again, I, I go back to week one. A, a, a thing that I that I that I praise Colorado for was in week one. They didn't have a lot of penalties. They had no procedural penalties, no 12 men on the field. And then as the season's gone on, they've gone more. I mean, look, the Travis Hunter penalty too, like punching a guy in the face when you have a first, when you have a you know fourth yeah. down force, like those penalties that just kind of had throughout the season. That again, they look like a team now that we expected them to be, which is a lot of new players, new coaches, a lot of things new, trying to figure things out. It just happened now week seven, not week one. Sammy, what are we bothering though? You uh you got any uh, any scuttlebutt? What what would we uh, would we fire on uh, this week that we haven't covered? I yet? wish you could see all my tabs open right now. It's sort of embarrassing. I have the Wake Forest depth chart. I have Santino Marucci's college bio, and I have Santino Marucci's high school <laughs> film. Uh, in case you don't know, Jacksonville. Right? Like he's a Florida kid, right? He is a Florida kid. Yeah, he's from Jacksonville. Um, he has played six snaps in his college career against Norfolk State. Um, there's a chance Santino Marucci is the starting quarterback for Wake Forest this week. Now, we're going to find out a little bit more today, uh, potentially into tomorrow. We know that Kern is out, and Griffiths is banged up. Those are the top two quarterbacks at Wake. If Santino Marucci is the starting quarterback, I'm being told Pitt's going to be like a four, four-and-a-half-point favorite. That line, as we record this, is Wake minus one. So I'm digging through the garbage, trying to figure out. It's if actually pick them. They're actually pickums out there right now, Sammy. They're actually a couple of pickums out there. So it's headed that way. Well, because people are watching Santino Marucci footage from high school. That's why it's moving to pick them. <laughs> I, I want to sit with Sammy while you scout high school quarterback film. I want to see that that process. I want to sit there and be a fly on the wall as Sammy is just on his computer furiously watching quarterback film from Huddle, some uh, some high school Huddle film. I want to be there. We should do this together as a group. We should watch Sammy watch high school film making his wages for the week. I, I'm I'm all for it. Well, unfortunately, I've I played Wake Forest. I don't care who the quarterback is. I didn't care that PJ Walker was a quarterback for the the uh, for the Browns last week. This is just a, it was a total play against Pitt. This is what we talked about it last week. The most college football result of the week was going to be Pitt beating undefeated Louisville. And it happened. Now, of course, Pitt is going to play this terrible Wake Forest team and lose. So Sammy and I are going to be rarely on an opposite side here. So uh, are you going to be angry bear on text messages on Saturday? Like you were last week? Um, no, no, I'll be okay. You're so angry, man. I, I was trying to wind you up. First, it didn't work, did it? No. It was a little hurtful. No. I, mean, I, I know. <laughs> Will, what do we got, brother? If we're going to have Sammy yeah, last, Cam, last, I hope... Go ahead. I was going to say, last week, I, I got, I, I'm giving you a big virtual hug. You, 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 you put some absolute stink bombs out there with Stanford and Michigan State, and, and Michigan State should have went out right, but they did Michigan State thing. So big virtual hug for getting those disgusting-sounding, gross teams out there, and they got the money. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you reach into your big garbage bag this week and see what you pull out. Yeah, I was going to say, if we're going to have Sammy Cam, I wish we had it last week when the Patriots took that safety to uh, to be, I know this is a college <laughs> pod, but that would have been, that would have been an entertaining one. I, I got a couple more. I'm going back to the well with Michigan State. They've played okay. I mean, we can laugh about it now because they ended up covering, but they did everything in their, in their power, everything imaginable to give that game away against the State University of New Jersey. Uh, 24 and a half is a lot. I don't know how much they're going to score, if they're going to score, but you got to figure, you know, that they played a little better. They're going to go into every trick that they 
they have in, in the bag to, you know, against Michigan. This is obviously a rivalry game. This is, they're going to get their best punch. Michigan is these top five teams haven't done well covering these big numbers. Uh, so I like Michigan state again. And uh, another one, just sort of on principle uh, Navy, when you have two service academies, don't you have to take the 10 and a half at home? I know Navy's bad. I know they're, they're not going to the college football playoff anytime soon, but Navy 10 and a half just on principle against air force is what I'm looking at too. Last 20 games between service academies, 17 times the underdogs have covered. So wow. there, 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 there you go. There's your, there's your note to end on. Will, Jeff, Sammy P, until next week. Another awesome gambling group chat there. I love Will's like sneaky bad games he wagers on. One, one he did not mention that I know he's wagering on is Arizona State getting points at Washington this yeah. weekend. I think it's 26 and a half now. It was 28 and a half. Um, Arizona State is like sneaky, not sneaky good, but they're one in five, but they played a lot of close games. That's kind of interesting, right? Washington, a letdown week. Mm -hmm. um, I like that for Will. He didn't mention that one. I, I, I want to make sure he gets his shine for taking Arizona State. I'm surprised, he, I'm surprised he didn't take Virginia as well. He get, yeah. get a bunch of points against North Carolina. Our Hill's coming off that big emotion, big win. It's, it's a good spot Miami. in college football, man. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of. Because Virginia's at home, though. Arizona State's on the road, right? Yeah. Those, two, those are obviously two different here. Uh, let's recap. Your your wager so far, then we get into best bets. So so far, you have Wake Forest a pick 'em against uh, against Pittsburgh, Auburn plus six and a half at home against Old Miss, and South Carolina plus seven at Missouri. All right, Bear, what is your best bet? Yeah, I, I am going to play Nebraska and lay eleven and a half with 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 the Huskers against Northwestern. Ooh, um, Northwestern. Yeah, oh, I mean they they've been blasted in their two road games. Uh, by Rutgers and Duke. And if Nebraska has done anything well this year outside of turning the ball over with Jeff Sims, uh, it's doing a good job shutting down really bad offenses. Uh, Minnesota scored 13, Northern Illinois 11, Louisiana Tech 14, Illinois 7. So maybe maybe the better bet might be yeah. to find a, a Northwestern team total and go under. But uh, I laid the 11 and a half here. It feels very 27-10-ish yeah. kind of game. And, and and, and hopefully uh, Matt Rule's team can build some momentum here, uh, get to a bowl after the turnover issues they had and given a couple of games away early in the year. Well, quarterback plays a lot better now, which yeah, makes a big difference. You, you play better when that happens. Northwestern, kind of, kind of the bulldozer, yes. Northwestern, it's just, it's not good. Um, all right, my best bet, and Barry, don't do this often. I don't bet on my team often, but I'm doing it this week. I'm taking Oregon. Ooh. There's 18 and a half out somewhere. I got on FanDuel this morning. Was there yesterday too, but Oregon minus 18 and a half hosting Washington State for a couple reasons. One is Oregon is very angry after the loss to Washington. I know this for a fact. They're angry. They're feisty this week. They want to get back on the field and, and show what they can do. But more than anything else, guys, Washington State, not very good anymore. Started fast, lost to UCLA two weeks ago. They lost 44 to 6 at home against Arizona. Arizona's that much was better. a stunning result. Like if you if you would have told me Arizona was yes. going to win there. That's fine. Correct. But like 44-6? Yes. And they won in ways that Oregon can duplicate because they they the Washington's offensive line is going through some issues. But Washington State's defense, 78th in yards per play, 91st on third down. I think Oregon comes out again. I don't do this often. I only do this when I feel really good about my team, essentially. I think Oregon comes out in this game and just puts it on the Cougars. They're back at home. They're very, they're very angry. Like they're very angry about how how Saturday. Are they went. angry and feisty? Um, they, I haven't and, been able to figure that, that out. Uh, I'm going to wager on that emotion in this game. I'll take Oregon here minus 18 and a half. I think they get the job done against the Cougs and then get ready for Utah, which you might you might be in Salt Lake City. We'll find out. Could be, yeah. We're yeah. still still deciding on what yeah. the uh, big noon site's going to be for next week, as of this. Uh, at least a little. Maybe they've decided they just haven't told me. Yeah, so I'm like the sixth Beatle on the show for some reason. <laughs> I, I'm just um, I'm, I'm just there on the on on the side set, not really uh Part of the main core, I guess it was. We love getting feedback from our listeners, whether you leave a review on the podcast, whether you go to our Twitter at Bear Bets Podcast. We asked you guys for your bet slips this week. What are you wagering on this week? We wanted to see because we tell you what we're wagering on. And these are again, these are wagers we're actually making. So thank you guys for sending that into us. We have one here that we want to highlight. It is from at Seahawk Sanders. He might be a, a Washington Husky fan, though. No, that no, that looks like a Steve Largent jersey. Yeah, but if you're a Seattle Seahawks fan, you might like the. the oh, 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 God. Okay, he's, unless you didn't put we put Oregon here, though. You ready? So he has, it's a it's a money line parlay, six legs: North Carolina, Texas, Oklahoma, Oregon, 
Alabama in college football and the Seahawks in the NFL. Oh, he asked, which team should they not trust? Uh, what do you think? Well, Scotty, I'm going to have to go with the, with, with the Seahawks. And, and I know yeah. that I know that's not something that you're going to want to hear because I know you like I like the Seahawks. Like the Seahawks yeah. But but NFL number like that, it, Cardinals kind of stink. Yeah. Seahawks, well, maybe I'm maybe I'm just bitter at the Seahawks. They should have beat. They should have covered for not, the for not, That was bad. I had the but Seahawks. But like, I, I can't see. I mean, obviously the four college, the four top ten teams. Texas there. and Houston. They, no, you? Houston's terrible. Houston's Texas terrible. Texas off a buy. Texas, Texas will drill them. What about Alabama? I, like, I guess there's a concern that Alabama might struggle offensively. Might they've struggled I, I, in every yeah, game this I, year? I, <laughs> I just don't know how many points Tennessee. I mean, Milton is not. Yeah, but, been... but can Tennessee win this game 21 20? Like it, it could. Like the, the Ar- 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 Arkansas, score Arkansas in the played them well. Alabama doesn't score in the second half. I mean, that tells me they obviously don't make adjustments well with with the personnel. I, they I have. guess I just didn't want to say the obvious one. The shortest money line price would be the one that obviously <laughs> well, I didn't, didn't look at it that way. But yes. Um, so again, please submit. Uh, but I, 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 I would I would think yeah. But pl- Plus 107 on this. Seems very seems very doable. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you'll uh, you'll you'll have a nice little plus 107 in your uh, in your ledger there. Come. Uh, come you Sunday do a Sunday weekly money line parlay, right? Do you, do you still do that or not? I do. I, I, I do. Yes. You used to text me at every Saturday. Yeah, I, I haven't. Just with the way the ro- I've been on the road, like I haven't done as many of them this year because yeah. i haven't found like a ton that i truly love and i but i did get burned a couple of weeks ago by miami against georgia tech <laughs> so i don't think i'd say that, that that's okay I mean, you know you know what i i've i've done is i've kind of, i've done a few where like i'll play around and move the number yeah like, and kind of, kind of, it's kind of like a, a tease but it's kind of like an alt line parlay. Yeah. That, that's kind of i've right. kind of done a few of those but i like the scott i, I think you're uh I think this ultimately will hit, but I do think the Seahawks or the Crimson Tide will certainly be in a game in the second half, and you might have to uh, be, be sitting in there in the uh, in, in the family room with a little bit of a, uh, a sweat going on. Hopefully, um, what I'd like to know: I mean, where, 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 is he, where does he watch the game on Sunday? Are, are, you, are you in your family He's room the, at the stadium? He has a picture of him at the stadium. Uh, oh yeah, he probably will be at the game too. Yeah, that's good, Scott. If you're listening, I'm assuming you are. If you are at the game, you might be able to, you might be able to open up some in-game opportunities uh, <laughs> a few seconds ahead of that's, opportunities that other people may have. So that maybe that maybe that was the strategy behind this wager. Yeah. Hopefully, you'll be alive to the sea bags. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Keep it coming. Good luck, bud. Nice large in jersey. Even though I hated the Seahawks when I was growing up, because the Jets could never ever ever beat them it didn't matter jim zorn and steve large and if they would have played the jets 16 day, games a year they'd both be hall of famers and then finally in finally in like 86 the jets beat the seahawks with the that was the year the jets had that great start of course yeah i was and then and, 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 and then they i remember that went in the i tank. remember that my, my parents like they, you know i was born in the summer and then like i was that fall i remember watching football as a newborn watching the jets and seahawks you, did, you didn't watch kurt warner against the dolphins in the uh in the in the in the, in the playoffs in 82 i think it was kurt warner kurt warner yeah running back penn state running back yeah. with seahawks i did not watch went to the game, went no. to the dolphin i think no. dolphins afc championship game i asked my parents <laughs> trip down memory lane there yeah i like it you have that, that i i hope to do that one day when i'm when i'm Older and tell people that I used to watch football back when they had leather helmets <laughs> or helmets. Uh, I hated the Dolphins too. Oh. The Jets, when the Jets lost the mud ball, that just absolutely sent me into just tears. I was so upset. That's how I felt on Saturday after Oregon lost. Yeah, but at least you got an opportunity to to maybe get a, get a bit Pac-12 title. Still, yes. the Jets are never going to have another opportunity to go to the Super Bowl. So no. Never. That, that was that was it. That was that was my that was my warning. Here 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 you are here you are, Chris. You're ten. I'm gonna give you an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. get, get, or eleven. What We're ten or eleven? I forget. I can't even do math anyway. All right. Enough. I'm rambling. You want, you want me? To, you, want, you want me to keep? No. I. You, 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 you want me to keep going going no, down memory lane? No, you're good. I, I, I think on that note, before people really do just turn us off uh, and just turn us off, I will 
officially say goodbye and thank you for tuning in to uh, Big Noon Kickoff's Bear Bets podcast this week. We had a lot of fun. Group chat was awesome as usual. The sneaky, sneaky, funny Will Hill. Sammy P. We're holding a nice Penix ticket. We're going to get, we're going to get Oregon to the Pac-12 title game. Don't I hope worry. so, we'll, buddy. We'll be in there. You probably get a good price on them still. To, I want to go to Vegas and watch that. December 7th. I would love to go to Vegas and watch that with yeah. you. But anyway, Will and Sammy, he's Jeff. I'm Bear. Remember, rate, review, subscribe, download all the places that you consume your digital media and your podcasts. We appreciate it all. And remember, the less you bet, the more you lose when you win.